So good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our program. My name is Jeanette Shaliga, and today our speaker is the wonderful Shelley Richards for the Niagara County Genealogical Society. She is the um, past chairman of the board and has been just an amazing, amazing help to our society over many, many years. How many years have you been a member, Shelley? Like 20, well, right? About, yeah, 20 with probably some a couple gaps in here when I lived yeah. in California, but yeah. Well, thank you so much. We are so excited to learn about the early Niagara um, County leaders and let's take it away. All right, thank you. Great. Wait. Hold on, Shelly. I muted you. <laughs> There okay. we go. There's go our technology right. fail because I went there to we mute go. myself and I muted you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Right. Go ahead, start again. All right, good. No, I'm, I'm glad to be inside. I didn't have to travel anywhere. It's we have a lot of snow here in Western New York today, so uh, and it's cold. Um, I'm not sure what it's like around the rest of the country, but um, yeah, and it is snowing as we speak. But hey, here we are, and uh, I always love this time of year for genealogy because you can really hunker down and you know, get a lot of work done, which I have. So just a little background to this presentation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it is really uh, what you're seeing today are things that I have pulled from the three books that I have written in the past. Uh, like I said, the two, St. Patrick's Cemetery, um, Glenwood Cemetery. These books featured a lot of uh, people in, um, that were in the cemetery, bios and then I'm currently writing the book on Grace Church and there's a lot a big bio section to uh, that book as well and also research that I've done for uh, myself but also other um, people that that have asked me to do research for them so uh, that's where I took it from and uh, let me just go to the next how do I advance my screen here Oop. Oop, there we go Oop. how do I back up there we hang on a little technology All right, there we go. Um, so what we're gonna do today is review select early leaders. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of people that could be part of this. Uh, there's a lot of leaders. I mean, there's, you know, every industry, every town has its leaders, et cetera. So we can't, but I, I've picked 13 that I consider interesting. I've tried to give male and female coverage as well. Uh, I'm focusing on they lived at one point in Niagara County. They weren't necessarily born here, but they were born between 770, 1771 and 1876. Um, as you know, Niagara County as an entity emerged uh, in 1808. Prior, prior to that, it was Genesee County, which was a huge, I think, covered Western New York all the way from like Geneva all the way to the uh, Niagara River. So I've actually got 13 biographies that I've included. Uh, lucky 13, and we're going to briefly review their ancestry uh, and their select descendants. So, so you're going to try to get an idea of maybe maiden names of the mothers, <clears throat> excuse me, and then their children, who maybe the children married, things like that. Uh, so, kind of, kind of round out the uh, their chart there, and then identify key contributions to Niagara County. Kind of what was their main their main contribution. So. Without that, we'll get on to the next one. Okay, now, so just another thing, I am doing these in order of their birth so that you get some sense of maybe how their contributions kind of went up, went forward. So um, he's Mr. Benjamin Barton Jr. is the earliest birth, 1771. He was born in New Jersey, and you're going to see most of these people, interestingly enough, that I've selected here were actually born um, out of the area, uh, many, many from the New England area, and uh, obviously migrated across the state to, to come to Niagara County. Um, he, a New Jersey, New, New Jersey guy, I know we've got somebody out there from New Jersey, and this guy one of the things that really impressed me was he really, because of who he was, he really opened up uh, not only Niagara County, but Western New York to trade 
to the progression of goods traveling from you know the east coast through uh, our con through our county and then at some point heading westward his family he did and his wife's family the lad is as you can see who he married in geneva new york her dad was a huge shipping guy on the Great Lakes. And, you know, it's funny when you really look at all these people, these biographies, these people who they married kind of combined to, to create who they became in terms of their, oftentimes their, their profession, their occupation, their contribution. But he came through New Jersey, uh, was dry, apparently driving cattle, got here, um, went back and forth a couple times. But by early 1805, um, he attended the sale of land on the Niagara River. Uh, and that's where he met uh, uh, General Peter Porter, who was another famous guy. I could have done him too, but I chose not to. This is where he started his Porter Barton and Company and commenced the carrying of trade around the, fall, the Niagara Falls area on the American side. It was both, uh, they called, it's funny, they used this word forwarders. So he was really pushed goods um, across the round, up and down, and all over the place. Um, he eventually settled in Lewiston right around 1807 and built the Barton House, uh, which still stands today in its second iteration. The first one was burnt down during the uh, War of 1812, but he rebuilt it, and the one that he rebuilt it still stands today. It's just an amazing place. Uh, uh, Place. He died in 1842. He's buried right in Lewiston, the Presbyterian Cemetery there. And there are some of the names of people at the end here, down at the bottom of this screen, for married these people with these last names. Um, um, a lot of them were in the trade that he was in. Uh, this Tryon guy, he, he was in, in the business with Barton. Whitney, uh, ships captains, transfer of goods. So there's a lot of these people have very similar things. Um, there's the Barton House, uh, circa 2009. That home uh, picture was given to me by uh, Peter, Peter Leister, who I saw is on our presentation today. Peter is a direct descendant of the Barton family. And, um, uh, that's actually why I did a lot of research on Barton was because of Peter. But so here's our first guy. Okay, the next guy, Thomas Thorne Flagler. I'll tell you, this guy was what I call. He did everything. <laughs> this guy's got so many interests, things that he was not only jack of all trades but master of, of many. His early career, he was a editor, publisher, newspaper printer. And you know how important communication is in the um, the early times that they lived in. This is the way they communicated with each other. Newspapers were exceedingly important. He married a uh, woman named Hulda Barrett, who was the daughter of uh, John and Hulda Bowen Barrett. And that those are two big names. Uh, the Bowens uh, were very prolific uh, legally in Niagara County. Just a little more on him. Eventually, probably his one of his major contributions is right here. The, the, he helped organize the Holly Manufacturing Company, which was an absolutely huge manufacturing company in this area. Early the fire hydrants, they, uh, they manufactured the, the, the tools and the machinery, uh, later uh, power for uh, Lockport area. So, I mean, that, you can't, this importance cannot be overstated. Uh, you can see the other things that he was really involved with, uh, Niagara County Bank, so money, got to have money, got to have a, a, a banking, uh, president of the Lockport Gas Light Company, Lockport Buffalo Railroad Company, Lockport Hydro. I mean, think of the import of these kinds of things to growing this community here. It's, it's, it's pretty unbelievable. Then he got involved in politics, like, oh, you know, what else can you do? Well, let's see, let me be a politician. Um, uh, just represent the district and the legislator and then was a congressman for a, a couple of years. So. Um, he, he was a, a big, well-connected man. He died in 1897 after a brief illness. 
Sullivan Caverno. Uh, very, very interested man. Uh, I've actually come across his name quite a few times in actually a couple of my books, uh, especially now the Grace Church book. His major contribution uh, after coming here from New Hampshire, getting his college degrees, he was a teacher first, as you can see, then became a lawyer. But then most importantly, uh, Lockport was the first city town in the whole United States to start the Union School Movement, which was the growth of public, public schools. He was the major contributor to that. That was his like passion, uh, aside from being a judge uh, or a, uh, excuse me, a lawyer. Uh, so his huge contribution was to the public education here in um, Blackport and Niagara County. His wife, maiden name was Kelsey. They had two, son two sons and two daughters, as you can see. And uh, master and examiner in the Chancery, the Court of Chancery being one of the pre preeminent courts in the United States. Like today would be like the Supreme Court. Back then it was called Court of Tran Chancery. He was a big deal there. Police board, uh, and again, the Union School. Thing. This guy's contribution. In fact, his obituary, which is, you can tell the prominence of somebody by the size of their obituary. His obituary took up like two columns. It was huge. So uh, I just actually found it not too long ago, but you can really, when someone has two columns in one of the old newspapers, you know they, they really meant something. Daniel Van Valkenburg, 1810-1872. This, this name, very, very big in, uh, in Lockport. He, his, uh, again, he, now he was born in New York, but came from Herkimer County, which obviously is much farther east. Moved this way. Uh, settled actually around the Tonawanda Creek area, but it, it, when he came, it was still, well, this whole Western New York area, as many of you know, was just forest. I mean, it was, you know, dense forest. You cut your way through to get anywhere. Well, this is his contribution is he was significant in the lumber trade. He started a lumber business, seeing that there was all this natural resource around him. And we all know how important lumber is to growing uh, a community. You got to build things. And this was his major contribution was the, uh, the lumber trade and building this business to be highly, highly successful to help our prosperity here in our county, but, but uh, not only Lockport, but actually throughout the county because of this lumber trade. He actually had lumber operations all over Western New York. Uh, he did a little bit with the, politics, sat on the city council. Um, he was married uh, three times by uh, the death of his wives, uh, Emmeline Carey, Aurelia Nash, and Lucinda Bruce. Uh, so lots of, lots of genealogical tie-ins there. He died at, he was pretty young when he died. I guess, I guess it wasn't so young then, but he is also buried in Glenwood Cemetery. Now, interesting story about him. He, he was so wealthy that when Glenwood Cemetery actually constituted itself in 1863, he, they, they had a bidding process, like who got the first choice of, of lots? He was the highest bidder and he bought, he has a huge, huge uh, lot. Actually, as you go in Glenwood Cemetery through the gates, if you look just off to your right and up on a hill, you'll see the Van Valkenburg stone. It's it's absolutely huge. And he kind of owns the top of the hill. <laughs> All right, Joshua Wilbur. Here's he's one of my favorites because this man, uh, born in Rhode Island, a couple other places have noted Connecticut. So I haven't resolved which one, but I'm gonna go with Rhode Island. Came this way on the packet on the Erie Canal. Uh, and he kind of had a, you know, he was a businessman, tailor, printer, druggist, but he went through a number of those businesses. But his real love actually started after he sold his uh, final business in 1902. He started recording the earliest history of Niagara County. And this is his absolute major contribution. In fact, 
his work was so significant that if you uh, are at all familiar with uh, the Niagara County Historical Society, his papers were the preeminent initial collection to become the Niagara County Historical Society. It was initially known as the Lockport Historical Society and later the Niagara County Historical Society. But his work from 1902 to when he died in 1917, he did oral histories with old residents, wrote, you know, firsthand accounts of history. He, he was like a living book. And you will see a lot of his work, uh, if you're at all familiar with Clarence O. Lewis, who was a later historian, quotes his work uh, significantly because he was the earliest, uh, the earliest uh, historian. He's considered the first historian of Lockport and Niagara County. Uh, he was married twice. Uh, his first wife was Mary Hickey. Uh, who was born in Ireland, and they had three uh, sons, Joshua Jr., William T., who became a uh, reverend, and George. And then his second wife, they, no children, um, she was kind of a society type person. And uh, after George died, or excuse me, Joshua died, she went and lived in other, other places. Now, some of Joshua's sisters were not Mrs. Judson Eddy and Mrs. Virgil Phillips. Uh, the, the, latter, the latter Mrs. Phillips was uh, still back in Rhode Island, so she must have never left Rhode Island. Now he's buried in St. Patrick's Cemetery, right, as, again, another one, right as you go in the gate, right, right behind the St. Patrick's Cemetery sign is his, uh, his stone and uh, it, it's still visible. It's been slightly defamed through some uh, vandalism over the years, but that's our Joshua, great guy. He lived to be quite old too as well, almost 90. Charles Keep, 1823, 1893. Now the Keep family, if you've all lived in this area, the Keep family, big, big name very big, very big name uh, at a number of different generations. Charles, you can see he was the son of uh, Charles Chauncey and Prudence Wolcott Keep, uh, and was born in central New York in Homer. And eventually, they're again, New England stock, as I mentioned, a lot of these people, you know, were born in the New England area or had generations that came that way. His, his father, his grandfather was Caleb, was born in Massachusetts and then Chauncey, who came to central New York in, in uh, Homer, New York. He came from farms, farmers. Then Charles uh, got into the farming business himself and then later got into, you know, being a merchant and things like that. And I guess that's where he got considerable money. So then he comes to uh, Lockport under the employment of his brother in the uh, brother's store. He got into the hardware business, got into the dry good business. Uh, again, big merchant, lots of money, lots of goods being sold. And then he got into buying and selling real estate, which he was probably one of the largest landowners in Niagara County at one time. Uh, he married, a, his wife was Caroline Crockett and she came from the city, uh, Boston people. Not sure how the Crockett's got to this area, but Charles also served uh, as a trustee on the Glenwood Cemetery Association as a trustee for about eight or nine years. That's how I came into contact with him. His, uh, actually would be his, um, probably his great, great uh, niece actually wrote a story about the family uh, she lives in Michigan now, uh, but she gave me a lot of this background information on uh, what would be her probably great grandfather, Charles. But Charles had three three sons, Henry, Wallace, I, and Roger, all Harvard educated, wealthy. Uh, Wallace in particular had a lot of influence locally in and in Niagara County. He was president of the Lockport Paper, Paper Company, which I believe in its iterations closed maybe 30 only 30 years ago he married into the ransom family who uh were very very early um 
her fa- her grandfather or her father was a huge a big judge um elias j ransom uh so he married he got connected that's kind of money connecting with money and prominence and uh he he really really was you know connected in, in a number of ways he lives uh his home if you know lockport at all is on the corner of high street and washburn street it's now known as the lockport presbyterian home that that was his family's residence so that was a that's a big house mother superior emily sisters of saint mary of namur born in 1824 in prussia as josephine kemen and entered the convent in 1844 in belgium uh final vows 1848 she basically got asked by her superior to come to America, go to America, start the uh, presence of the Sisters of St. Mary of Nemours in, in, in America. And that initial place was Lockport, New York. She's one of the five original nuns who uh, created, they're educators, you know, these nuns are, have educational missions. That's kind of how they, 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 they entrench themselves is basically starting schools. They originally started at uh with saint john's uh saint john's catholic church in a like a basement there and then a few years after they got here the the academy saint joseph's academy was built at the corner of church in ontario streets and they they remained there until actually when it was torn down and sadly torn down 1969 uh the, the sisters of saint mary of namur are still in this area uh, they have a have a place here. Their mother house is now in Buffalo, but she's her significance is she was the first American superior of the Sisters of Saint Mary, and she you can see she was in that role for 24 years. Uh, and when she got named superior, she chose the name. Uh, they called her Mother Superior, as kind of the Catholic lexicon of the way things go. She died in 18, 1887, and again, you know, you see how. The big, it was a huge article, and specifically a woman having a huge article written about them in that day, that was a pretty big deal. She's obviously buried in St. Patrick's Cemetery here in Lockport. Uh, the sisters have a, a huge plot on the hill. There's probably uh, almost 80 sisters that are buried in St. Patrick's Cemetery throughout, throughout the cemetery. And I got this fabulous, I, this picture that I'm gonna show you now, this is the most, I think, one of the most fascinating pictures that I that I've ever seen. It's a picture of because it's showing Sister Emily down here on the death catapult, right down here. This the rest. This is the chapel of Saint Joseph's Academy. This was given to me by uh, one of the local sisters, Sister Renee Roberto, shared th this photo with me. And down here, you can see the nuns all, uh, you know, attending to her, you know, her laying out. Um, and the beauty, the beauty of this academy, you can see, I, it just breaks my heart today. My mother and my grandmother were both graduates of St. Joseph's Academy. And the, the thought, and I, and I had been in the building a couple of times as a young child, but the thought that this building just got ripped down, just, it breaks my heart every time I think about it. But Sister Emily, one other significant thing. So not only did she influence Niagara County, there were six other academies she established about four in Texas and two in Ontario, Canada. So she just had a huge influence on the education of young people, young women uh, in not only Niagara County, but obviously in other parts of the county as well as the sisters spread their presence around. But Mother Emily really, I mean, I can't believe she did what she did not only here, but in those other places. Tim Ellsworth, big war hero, big war hero. Lots of stories about him um, throughout. Originally from Connecticut, uh, came again, came to Lockport on a, a packet, canal packet, 1858. Went off to uh, went off to war, um, Civil War, and became a war hero. Uh, you can see the little story down at the bottom. But he basically got the message through for General Wadsworth to have the portion of the army fall back before they were killed. 
the first guy did get killed. They named Wadsworth, the, your, your Ellsworth, the, your, your, it's your turn now. And he, he dashed through and got through. So that kind of war hero business followed him through the, uh, through the rest of his life in Lockport. He was a, a, quite a hero in Lockport. Interestingly enough, uh, Ron Logbacker, the former caretaker of Glenwood Cemetery, found out that he didn't, oh, excuse me, found out that he did not have a marker on his grave. And greatly enough, Ron went to huge, Ron was a superintendent of uh, Glenwood at the time, researched the guy's whole background and finally got this marker, uh, marker and you can see it down there at the bottom, uh, placed on, on his grave is a great deal of respect. But after the war, he married um, Aressa Shoemaker, uh, who he, he, he met when he was in a boarding situation. When he first came to Lockport just prior to the Civil War, he, he met, uh, he lived in a boarding house run by this Lucy Shoemaker and her daughter, Aressa. And Aressa later became his wife. Uh, so he married her. But she died a year after they were married, which is kind of sad, um, just after the Civil War ended. And then he never remarried. Uh, he practiced law. He was a lawyer. A lot of these, I would say about half of these guys were lawyers that I'm talking about today. So being a lawyer kind of really led to a lot of significant leadership opportunities back in the day. Uh, he became a state senator and at one time was supposedly a, to be a candidate for the governor, uh, but he died in 1904. It was such a major event that the whole city closed. Uh, when I read his obituary, I said, wow, that, that's a big deal when, you know, your city shuts down the day that you die. That, that's a pretty big honor. Uh, here's, here's some of his uh, relations names, uh, sister Harriet Green of Lockport, Anna Ellsworth Rochester, Henry Ellsworth Rochester. So a lot of his, uh, his siblings are living in Rochester. But then again, we have a, a nephew, uh, George Ellsworth Green here in Lockport. John Pound, I never, I went to John Pound school. He, this guy was this guy is another guy, jack of all, master of many. This guy did so much, and he does have a school named after him. I never knew what the E meant until I did, you know, more research on him, Evermond, which is uh, interesting. Typically, a man back in those days, their middle name was their mother's maiden name. That was a very, very typical convention that they took on, but I, he, that, I'm not sure where that Evermond comes from, but that's probably a female name in his family, I, I would bet. Now his mother's name was Almina Whipple. So uh, that didn't come from there, but he, uh, English extraction, um, he has an ancestor, Michael Pound. He was born, obviously born in Lockport, big graduate from an Ivy League school, Brown University, again, law. Uh, then went, you know, was also in the war prior to his graduation, uh, then came back to, to Lockport where he became, got involved in politics, supervisor, mayor, then kind of started moving up in the ranks, U.S. District Attorney, U.S. Commissioner, President of the Board of Education in Lockport, trustee of the Home of the Friendless, which is the forerunner to Wyndham Lawn Home. Um, he only he had one daughter, Elmina, who was uh, died at 21, and, and uh, so they had no and she had no children, was not married, didn't have any children, so that he does not have any progeny of his and Elmina's. George Lewis, this guy, you know, when I did his biography, and I've actually done research on him very recently, I was so impressed that this guy see seemed like such a self-starter, such a go-getter. Uh, his parents died when he was really young and he was raised by a maiden aunt, Charlotte Cross. Now, again, if you're familiar with Lockport educational system, Charlotte Cross was a prominent, prominent uh, educator in the public schools and has uh, a school named after here in the city of Lockport, uh, out on the west, uh, west end of uh, Lockport. Again, a lawyer, got into the, the whole law, law end of things. And again, now, interestingly, he worked for Tim Ellsworth and his, who we just talked about. 
he became a student uh, of law in the uh, Timmy Ellsworth, and I'm not sure who Potter's first name was, but um, he got involved with them. And then he went, uh, finally went on to Albany as a confidential clerk or private secretary of the state controller. So he got really high up in state politics, lived in Albany for a number of years, married Clara Bowen, and there's another big name. Dad was a huge judge. So again, we see all these legal people connecting in legal circles, right? So he he was in a lot of different power situations, uh, not only himself, but then marrying the daughter of Judge Bowen, who was uh, on the Supreme Court. So he, he had a big name and then got a bigger one when he married the, the daughter. Was a real go-getter. The the wife Clara had her own. She was, which was kind of unusual for a woman at that time to be so so involved. But she, um, Liberty Loan Drives, World War One Women's Committee and Secretary of the Red Cross, directress of many years for the Wyndham Law Home for Children, aka Home of the Friendless. So the wife was in a, you know, very active as well. But look at this guy in terms of all the things he started. Charter member of the Rotary Club, very, very involved in that. First president of Lockport Boy Scout Council. So these are these are kind of institutions in Lockport. Uh, and he was he was a starter of those. Uh, trustee YMCA, American Bar Association, a Mason, Lockport Glass Company, which was a big maker of all sorts of glass bottles and sort in uh, Lockport. Director, VP of the Niagara Paper Mill. So he's just involved in all these, these very things. Now, another interesting thing, his son, George C. Jr. married Henrietta Grigg. And many of you may be familiar with the Grigg Lewis Foundation, which is probably the biggest foundation in the county and still operational to this day and still very, very uh, uh, philanthropic to the to the eastern part, not only Niagara County, but especially especially the eastern part of the of the county, where they concentrate some of their their funding. Uh, senior died uh, in 1943. We wouldn't be complete without mentioning this man. This man, uh, 1872, 1965, William Rankinen Jr. was probably, and I am. Saying this, I haven't added up all the figures, but probably one of the most philanthropic leaders in Niagara County and Lockport and elsewhere. But to, to Niagara County, the man has given millions and continues to give millions. Just help build the YMCA, the new YMCA. His foundation continues to give, just gave uh, a half a million dollars to help build the, the new YMCA here in Lockport. But he is a native North Carolinian, uh, married Mary Virginia Hargrave, graduated University of North Carolina, uh, was an engineer by trade. His big thing where that he was kind of a pioneer in was this manufacture of acetylene gas. And that's really what kind of eventually got him to, to a Western New York. Um, he came here, well, hired by carbide manufacturing in Niagara Falls to build and operate a calcium carbide plant. Uh, in the, and that was attached to the acetylene industry. So he was, got his start really in the, in the sciences. And uh, his sister, and here's where the, some of the money starts coming in. His sister, Mary Lilly, married Henry Flagler. Now Flagler, you can see who he is associated with with John D. Rockefeller and the Standard Oil Company. You can just smell the money there. But the other big thing that this Henry Flagler did is he saw opportunity in Florida. He convinced his brother-in-law to go into business with him down there to build the East Florida East Coast Railway. And in doing building that railway, he acquired what I heard described is almost one seventh of the landmass of Florida at the time that he was doing this in the early 1900s. The man was wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. In fact, if you go down to St. Augustine today, you will see Flagler's name all over the place. Uh, it's, it's still very prominent there. But the connection here with Keenan is 
Henry Flagler died, left his money to Mary Lilly. Then Mary Lilly died and left all her money to her uh, siblings, William, Jesse, and Sarah Keenan. So all of a sudden you've got this major, major fortune, lots of money now. And he's got this kind of making his money on his own, but now he's got a lot of his, his, his uh, sister's money on top of it, which you can really kind of see begin the philanthropic underpinnings. So this guy is just an amazing guy. Western Block, Ranley Farm, Camp Keenan, he donated in 1924, $150,000 to the YMCA to, dis, to, to, to build Camp Keenan. That would be the equivalent today of $2.25 million. So he started out really early. He built the nurses building at Lockport Memorial Hospital. He has the uh, Keenan Stadium was erected with monies at, at, at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. That stadium is named Keenan Stadium. That's William Rand Keenan, our guy from Lockport. Um, in the early 60s, he donated $100,000 to Glenwood Cemetery, which today would be just shy of a million dollars. And then he left his home over here on Locust Street. I live about a block from there. His home and all his property to the First Presbyterian Church, and they developed the Keenan Center, what we know as the Keenan Center today. And it he then had a, a secondary endowment uh, to help then build and manage that, uh, make a permanent endowment for the Keenan Center. That legacy still lives, just absolutely. The, 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 and I'm sure I probably have not accounted for a lot of stuff that he's that he uh, gave otherwise, but he's just a huge leader and philanthropist for Niagara County. Marie Holly. Uh, what a powerhouse, established the first kindergarten in Lockport. And it was credited to being the first in the country, which is, that's kind of neat. I never knew that until I studied this woman's uh, history a little bit. She uh, was, maiden name was Bement, Bement, or Bement uh, and also started the Lockport Mothers Club. One of the things I was impressed with about her life was that she really saw the importance of early childhood education and support for mothers and support for parents. And then she got hugely involved with the PTA, uh, which was, again, uh, not only a local, but a state and a national uh, organization. So she was very, very involved with them and really dedicated a lot of her life to looking out for the care and education of, of young children and supporting parents and the, being their children's first teacher. She was also a longtime president of the Ladies Guild at Grace Episcopal Church, very active in the leadership uh, of that uh, church. And I guess we could have, Herbert Harrison probably did more for not only, obviously Lockport, Niagara County, but Harrison Radiator Division, which is still cooking, it's under a, diff a, a different name, but Herbert Harrison developed the radiator and then Harrison Radiator Company basically put Lockport on the map, not only in the state, but nationally and internationally, uh, and eventually becoming part of General Motors Corporation. But Herbert, his background, he was born in Calcutta, India, of all places. So um, Francis Harrison and Lillian Riley, two sisters, Margaret, and most of them stayed in England, as you can see, but he, he came to the US and got involved in the Susquehanna Smelting Company. And then that got, was brought from PA to Lockport. And then he sold the company to the Union Carbide Company in Niagara Falls, began as consultant. 1910, he started, he organized Harrison Radiator Company. He had these ideas that he wanted to put to work. Their you know, cars were just coming into, uh, you know, fashion then, uh, and he began with producing these radiators for uh, American cars. Uh, I believe the first car he comp did one for was the Covert, Covert Automobile Company here in Lockport, which later went defunct, but that's kind of how he cut his teeth. And then subsequently, United Motors Corporation bought them out, and then later uh, General Motors took them over. So uh, 
and the rest is really history. I mean, this company is still there. It's certainly not maybe the company it, it once was, but boy, it really, really made a huge difference in, in, in this county and in Lockport in terms of just the commerce, the jobs, very, very, very influential in the manufacturing. I mean, I don't know about you folks, but when I was growing up, uh, two thirds of your friends, their parents worked at Harrison Radiator. It was big, big, big. He married a widow, uh, Maria Florence Maria Kemp Bryant. She had a son from her first uh, union, Ernest. And then she and Her Herbert had three sons, Arthur, Charles, and John, or Jack, known as Jack. They lived on Chestnut Ridge Road in a mansion called Stonehurst, which is now DeSales Catholic School. So if you, you're driving by DeSales School, that old building uh, that faces uh, Chestnut Ridge, that's, the, that's their former mansion, Stonehurst. He actually died in London on a business trip with his uh, wife and son, and he never came back here. He was actually buried. He's buried in London. So his estate, just as a matter of, of interest, uh, was settled. I think that the figure I'm giving there was the net, the net figure, 3.1 million back in 1921, would it be about 48 million and some change today. So um, he was a wealthy guy. So. Okay, uh, that's my that's my thirteen kind of leaders, select leaders of Niagara County, and I, I'm certainly happy to make, take any questions. Well, thank you so much, Shelley. I'm going to stop recording so that everyone can feel comfortable to turn on their cameras and ask questions.